just got back from Europe for a month, so I'm not quite used to this heat. So uh, I'm not jealous of you guys playing out that heat today. Um, but no, thank you all for uh, you know coming and playing in this tournament. Um, you know, you've probably heard this a million times, but junior golf is some of uh, my best memories, um, you know, it's, it, it laid and paved the foundation for me to uh, become, you know, a professional golfer um, and uh, to do, you know, a bunch of cool things, get to travel the world, um, and then recently uh, led us to be able to start uh, the Taylor Goose Foundation, uh, which now led to us being able to bring this tournament here uh, in my home state. Um, Kelsey Klein, uh, it's been like my big brother since I was 10 years old. Uh, as, as he was just noted, he's the executive director of, of the foundation. Um, he first uh, caddied for me when I was 13 years old at a uh, U.S. Junior Amateur Qualifier. I think we shoot 67, six, I think we shot 67, and then uh, a guy into a playoff, three for one playoff. And, um, and a guy, Dragon Majors, made about a 40 foot bomb on the first hole to kick us out. So, uh, but that was the first time that he caddied for me. Um, and he, in his own right, is a great player, played at OU. Uh, and, and, I mean, yeah, great player. Uh, was it, what's, uh, was it Prairie, runner up? But was that behind Charles? Okay, well, anyways, uh, Kelsey's been an integral part of my life. I wouldn't be here without him. Uh, we have, you know, incredible stories from my junior golf days to my amateur days to my professional days. Uh, he's been along for the ride, and, and I wouldn't be here without him. Like I said, first caddy for me when I was 13 years old at a U.S. Junior Qualifier. Uh, caddy for me uh, in numerous USGA events. Uh, we're starting to date ourselves now because the public links isn't a tournament anymore. Um, but uh, a bunch of US, you know, junior amateurs, U.S. amateurs, uh, and then the most recent uh, success we had uh, was he came and caddied for me when um, I was playing on the Web.com tour back in 2017. Uh, he had to fill in for my full-time caddy, and we won that week, and that got me my PGA Tour card, so that was pretty sweet. Um, and then now he's, he's running the foundation. Um, let's see, I mean, again, like I said, thank you guys for being here. Um, you know, this is a fantastic golf course. I was uh, talking with Kelsey um, as I was riding around, kind of checking everybody out. Uh, man, this, this is a, I mean, this is a professional manicured type of golf course. This is what we, the type of golf course you're gonna see on the PGA Tour, on Live, on the Web. Corn Ferry Tour, you're everywhere. This this golf course is in great shape, so you'll have a, a really good place for the you know for the week to play. Um, you know the wind is a little bit of an Oklahoma wind. I know we got a, a bunch of kids from Oklahoma here. We got some kids not from Oklahoma here, so you're getting a little uh, preview of, of what uh, some Oklahoma wind is like. Uh, like I said, I just got back from uh, Europe. I played the British Open last week. I didn't play well, but I got a little bit of wind there as well. Not quite the same type of wind. It was about 55 degrees and blowing 30, not 95 degrees and blowing 30. Um, but yeah, you, you guys are just in such a cool you know, spot in, in your golf journey. You know, wherever you guys go from here, um, you know, the beautiful thing about this game is uh, whether you decide you want to play college golf or professional golf or whatever you want, um, you know, golf is, for me, as I say, it's a vehicle. It's, it's gotten me to where, you know, I am now, um, and it's something that it's just provided, you know, not only for, you know, my family and, and the foundation and for people around me, but it's, it's taught me, you know, so much about life, how to handle situations outside the golf course and, um, so again, no matter uh, who plays, um, you know, collegiately or professional golf or anything like that, that's all all great. But um, you know, just continue to to know that golf is going to teach you the lessons that is going to you know make you a better husband one day, a better wife one day, you know, a, a better employee, a better boss, everything in between. Um, you know, I have so many friends nowadays that um, are no longer uh, athletes uh, that love to play golf and, and it's a way to bring people together from all walks of life and, um, you know, if 
find a dollar for every time I've heard someone say, man, I wish I would have started playing younger. And I'm going to assume most of you here started at a pretty young age, so you guys are off uh, to a really good start. And, um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction there, Taylor. Going off of that, quick question to the both of you. Um, going on to the Taylor Gooch Foundation, what are your goals for the Taylor Gooch Foundation the next couple of years, kind of looking long term? Man, that, that's a great question. Um, for us, um, we're both from Oklahoma. Uh, we both still live here. Uh, so we're going to continue to focus on you know our community, the Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and then just the greater community of Oklahoma. We we want to continue to uh, give opportunities for for kids, uh, whether that be through schooling or sports or whatever it may be. We just want to give kids opportunity that can't provide that opportunity you know by themselves or don't have others to help give them that opportunity. Um, you know we've partnered with a couple of great organizations. Um, one here locally called Positive Tomorrows, another one called Hope is Alive. Uh, obviously, golf is going to be you know a mainstay for what we focus on because of what it's done for me and and for us and and what we think it can do for others. And so uh, we of course have dreams and aspirations of continuing uh, our support of both you know the the local junior golf tour, the Oklahoma Junior Golf Tour, and the JGA as well. Um, yeah, so I mean. I don't know if you want to add more to that, but... Yeah, I mean, to reiterate that, it's, you know, on Taylor's first part of the talk, you guys are so fortunate. You know, I would like to, to give a uh, hats off to the parents or maybe even grandparents that fund these excursions because, you know, um, you guys don't get here for free and it's, you know, it can be taxing on things, but, you know, there's sacrifice involved, but... Um, looking at everybody and being out there today, you know, Taylor and I were you guys, you know, for me a long time ago, for him a little bit ago, and, and to let you guys know how truly fortunate that you are that you have parents and or grandparents or somebody in the system that's paying to get here because it's not free. Um, and so, you know, whenever you take the time to give give them a hug or say thank you, it's, it's surely well deserved. So, um, you know, foundation wise, like Taylor said, it's probably a good thing that that I have to run everything by him and his wife because I'm soft, I want to give everybody the money and I would probably give out all the money. Um, but to help people in our community and see people that we know that come up and say thank you for what you're doing. We've had some people today, you know, when I was on the first tee, um, greeting everybody that say thank you for hosting this and thank you for being here. And that, that that's as good as it gets for us. Because like I said, we were you guys and, and gals. Um, we did the same thing. We wanted to play college golf. We wanted to play professional golf. Um, and being along the ride for his career and his dad Ron sitting in the front in the blue, you know, him and his wife Amber allowed me to be in, in Taylor's path at a young age and now that I'm a father, you know, I can appreciate it much more because I understand that that's a, that's a big deal to a parent. So, Ron, thank you because without you I wouldn't be here and I've told Amber that. She doesn't always listen, but thank you uh, for allowing me to be a part of this since 2002 and for us to get here. Um, but, you know, junior golf, what you guys don't realize just yet is the, the thing that I look back on most, and I know Taylor does as well, is the relationships that we have and built and the memories. Nick Hughes right here at the third table, he and I probably met when we were 11. I don't have much hair left. Nick's still got great hairs, I tell him very often. But we've been friends for 33 years now. You know, and now I'm watching his kids grow up and watching them play in these things, and we've been friends for that long because of golf. Now, after golf, you know, it takes work to keep up a friendship and a relationship, and Nick and I have done that, but I want you guys to know, I know you guys all want to play great, you want to win, and that will come with hard work, but if you don't, I mean, what you're getting to do from a life standpoint, you're going to look back on and, and realize sooner than not that this is about as good as it gets. Um, Taylor, obviously, you know, you can read about or watch what he's done, and it's fantastic, but these days are, are few and far between. They'll go fast. And I hope that you guys enjoy it from the foundation standpoint to be able to help them put this on. Riley and Hannah, thank you. You know, Taylor, you and your wife, you know, you guys are the decision makers in the end on these things. And I hope we can do it far into the future and give you guys the opportunity to have a great experience that, that he and I have had a lot with tournaments, whether it be in the amateur ranks or into the pro ranks. You know, this is a, this is a pretty good deal. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you guys. Go on.
going. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. A little bit of technical difficulties there. Um, going into your kind of junior career, do you have a AJGA memory that stands out to you or that was kind of your favorite through your playing days? Yeah, so I won one AJGA tournament and it was about 30 minutes away at Oak Tree. And so uh, that obviously is the first one that comes to mind for me. I was uh, fortunate enough to play some some cool ones uh, like the ping at uh, Carson Creek. I ended up playing college golf at uh, Oklahoma State as well. And that was kind of my first taste of what Oklahoma State golf was, uh, playing the, the, you know, the AJGA there um, at the end of the, the season. That was really, really cool. And the golf course kicked my butt. And uh, made me realize I need to get I need to get better at this. Um, so yeah, those are the first two that come to mind: is uh, the one at Carson Creek and then the one that I won. Kind of looking through your junior career and obviously the success you had then, and then going into college, what do you feel like you were able to do to separate yourself as a junior golfer versus the competition that you faced? Um, obviously, you know it. Hard work. I mean, time. Um, I feel like I, I probably spent more time at the golf course than most of the guys that I was playing against. Um, you know, it's it, there's there's no replacement uh, for for hard work for digging it out the dirt. There's no replacement for uh, the grind and and just the dedication. You know, you you have to earn everything that you get out of this game. And um, you know, as as you continue to as I've continued to progress in my career, you you see further and further along that, you know, nobody has success really at any level in this game without uh, a bunch of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, you know, you, you got to put your heart into it and you got to love it. Absolutely. Going off of that, you know, compared to when you were a junior are now, obviously, working with Boyd um, as your coach, how has your warm-up routine kind of evolved through your junior career, collegiate career, to where you're at now? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was, call it 15 years old, uh, I probably actually spent more time, um, you know, through practice, through warm-up, uh, week in, week out than I do now. You know, I've, I've had a little bit more time to kind of see how to optimize the time that I do spend. I also have a wife and a two-year-old daughter, so I have to optimize my time a little bit, a little bit more now. Um, but yeah, no, I... I that's a great question. I mean, every what makes golf so unique is there's no template. Like, there's no rhyme or reason why something works for somebody. You know, I've been fortunate to see, you know, Dustin Johnson, and you know, week in and week out to see how he does it. I've you know seen Rory McIlroy and Brooks Kepka and all these you know the greatest players of our generation. I've I've been able to see up close and in person how each one of them goes about uh, their business, and you know it's not the same. Everybody has something different, and um, but the one thing that you know that isn't different is time. You you know this game, um, unlike you know most other sports, it just takes time. You gotta and and for that you know you you can't force it. You have to love what you're doing, um, and you know for me. Uh, fortunately, since I was you know nine years old, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do, and uh, I've loved it you know every second of the way through all the ups and the downs, and you know you have to learn uh, learn to love the failures of it because you're you're going to have a lot of failures in this game and a lot of down moments, and you have to learn how to love that. And for me, uh, you know, at the position that I'm currently in, I've, I've probably had. You know, as much or more, you know, failures than a lot of guys that I'm competing against, and so I've I've had to learn even more so than you know the Dustin Johnsons and the Rory McIlroys that um, you know this this game isn't going to give anything to you. This 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 game is going to uh, you know make you earn it, and you just you got to love every every ounce of it. Boy, thank you for joining us, kind of going over that with what he's worked with and, and kind of working with you. What's it like to see guys like Taylor and other guys that you coach find such success at such a high level? I was told to come in late so we could go over the rules. One second late is a two-shot penalty, more than five minutes is a DQ, right? <laughs> All right, don't do that this week. The thing that's really cool about Taylor, and he mentioned it, everyone does a little bit differently. Everyone has different strengths and weaknesses, but 
first off, when I went on site with Taylor, his first uh, tour event, and all the way through what he's doing now on the lift tour, he changes his targets left, right, flight of shot, draw, cut, and I told him right after, I was like, that's the best routine I've ever seen on tour. It's the most simulated. A lot of guys are setting up an alignment stick and only hitting at the same target over and over and over, and you know, Taylor shifts his lines so much and the clubs, he'll go to a driver, a pitch shot, a flighted wedge shot, back to a four iron, and go through the par three holes or just the tee balls that he knows are going to be critical, and that really impressed me, but um, yeah, it's really cool to see how different people do it at the highest level, and you're all going to find out through your careers what works best for you, and it's good to you know admire these tour pros, but you want to look at a wide range a variety of players. Some hit it far, some hit it a little, you know, a little shorter. Ryan Harmon just won, and he's definitely a little bit below average. And I think each of you could look up to a different player, see what kind of strengths and weaknesses compared to the players, and emulate that way. And we were just talking at the Open Championship a little bit about um, Tiger Woods. He was my hero growing up, and and I copy, tried to copy his swing, and I was really bad for my game. So do it your way. And stick to the people that you work with, stay consistent, and I think that's the best thing you can do. Thank you. Obviously, you guys, all three of you are very invested in junior golf, um, and it's kind of changed since the days that you guys were all playing to now. Um, what changes have you seen, whether it be competition or kind of the status level of things? Where do you think it's going in the future, and how is the Taylor Beach Foundation kind of helping that? Well, I was fortunate, like I said, to be on the first tee all morning to watch everybody tee off and how the game's changed or how it could change. And Boyd sees this every week with his crisscross of the country. I mean, uh, of the females I saw, I saw one fairway that was missed, about three yards left of the fairway, and, and the guys I saw tee off. Um, I made the comment that it, it didn't look like this when we were 15. And so, you know, what is that? We've all heard, well, Tiger forced everybody to get better or bigger or stronger, which there's a lot of truth to that, but at the same time, you know, if, if you guys weren't out doing the work and working out, I'm sure somebody, some of you guys have trainers and eat right most of the time, um, the game looks different. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to be out there and see it up close. I follow, you know, apps and scores like a lot of the parents of, of a young man that I know or that I've followed, um, but the game from what the ball does, the way it sounds, the way it looks, looks completely different. A quick story, I went to Vegas three years ago and I took a friend of mine from St. Louis that's about 66 at the time. He was a golfer growing up. His claim to fame is beating Payne Stewart in the state championship by one stroke, which he wouldn't tell you that, so I tell people that. But we're at the, the putting green at 6.30 in the morning because Taylor teed off early and he's just standing there staring. And I said, hey man, what, what are you doing? And he said, well, golf didn't look like this when I was growing up. He said, I can't believe what these guys look like. And, you know, if you go to a tour event or watch many events on TV, the guys look like athletes, whether it be a basketball player, or a couple of guys look like linebackers. You know, the game physically is different. You know, boy, you can speak to that a little more on the numbers and the data and all the things that, that go into that. But you guys are seriously putting in work. I think young men and women that might have played other sports in the past are maybe gravitating towards golf, whether that be their choice or a parent pushes them or a grandparent. So, you know, physically the game to me looks so much different. And, and you know, uh, the athletes that are playing golf, it, it translates into what, you know, what it looks like out there. And I noticed it right away this morning. So, um, and then the foundation on trying to help that. I mean, Taylor obviously gets, gets a chance and is fortunate to speak at certain things and encourage. But again, you know, the physical side of what you guys are doing is as, is as important as the driving range or the putting green. I think you guys all know that, knowing a few of you in here that, that, that train and, and do things and their parents get them to work out. So, I mean, it's, it's become, I mean, if you want to do it long term, Taylor will tell you, you know, uh, you need to start now, you know, whether it's uh, for muscle or that or, you know, uh, maintenance, the maintenance side of things. So the physical side is becoming or is so prevalent in the game. Iron sharpens iron, 
Golf's gotten bigger and bigger. The purses have gone up. It's attracting different athletes that wouldn't have naturally come and played golf. But the courses you guys play, even this one, they're so much more challenging when I play junior golf. They're playing at the U.S. Junior and U.S. Girls Junior you know, championship courses, places they've played major championships on. It's hard not to get better when you're playing against better competition and better golf courses. Yeah, I mean, um, we talk about it, you know, out on the road about how, you know, they, these kids in college are just bombing the ball. I mean, that is the biggest difference that I see now versus uh, when I was in junior golf is, you know, when I was in junior golf, I was in the upper echelon of distance and now in college golf and junior golf, I, you know, relatively speaking back then, I probably would have been right in the middle or below average. The, the, you know, the game has changed from a distance perspective, and that's not just equipment. That's, as they're saying, it's just athletes, you know. Um, there's so many more, I think, kids that uh, have access to golf and have, um, you know, a desire to play golf now versus, you know, 20 years ago. It's just, man, it's cooler. Like, you see the Dustin Johnsons and the Roy McIlroy's and the Tony Finau's and these dudes that, you know, make the game cool. And um, that's, I think that's a great thing for golf. But, you know, as, as they both said, you know, if, if you do aspire to do this, you know, professionally, you know, I don't know many guys at that level that didn't start when they were, you know, young, 15 or younger. Um, you know, it's something that is going to be challenging if you wait until you're in college to get serious about it. Um, and so if you're wanting to do this at the highest of levels, you know, you need to, need to start taking it seriously now. Thank you, guys. Um, obviously, this is the first time that the Taylor Reach Foundation and yourself have hosted an AJGA tournament. What made you want to partner with the AJGA kind of host this tournament and why at this time? Yeah, I mean, the AJGA is it's the preeminent tour of, of junior golf in, you know, in the States. And so, um, you know, like I said, we've, uh, you know, supported the Oklahoma Junior Golf Tour. But, you know, we wanted to, you know, help and be a part of, you know, the best junior golf tour, you know, in the country. And the AJGA is that. And, um, you know, we want to see some of the best junior golfers come and play in Oklahoma that aren't just from Oklahoma. Um, and, and so for us, it was a, a no-brainer to, to be a part of. And, and just selfishly, you know, growing up and uh, playing in the AJGA, you know, just the idea of, of coming back and, and seeing the kids play and to, you, you know, be a part of that is just, it's cool, man. It's something that, you know, earlier I said, you know, I, I dreamed of playing professional golf and dreamed of, of winning, you know, tournaments, um, but I didn't dream of having, you know, our foundation, you know, be a part of an AJGA event. And so it's just something beyond what I could have dreamed as a kid. You know, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Um, all of us up here, you know, we were you guys. We did it, and so we understand what you're going through. We probably appreciate it a little more than some of you guys might. Um, and so when, when Nick Hughes brought the idea of this, having already talked with the AJGA and the golf course and having two sons in the mix right now with junior golf, you know, I immediately said, well, sure, you know, I'll – I'll talk with Taylor and his wife about it to see if that's something that would be in the budget. Um, and so to have a friend, like I said, of 32 years, 33 years, you know, just to start that whole process, not really have, having had any thought of, of doing one of these yet, you know, I can look back and, and to say we're lucky or we're fortunate or, you know, those things, I, I, I can't really put it into words, you know, how it feels, you know, what golf's done for me personally. All three of us up here, you know, Boyd and I met in college in 97. Yes. You know, 97 became friends in college before he, he went off to, to uh, a mission and then came back and turned pro and then we, we lost touch. And so when Taylor and I sat down a few years back and Taylor was thinking about interviewing some swing coaches, Boyd's name came up and Boyd and I had, had, had kept in touch and maybe secretly I told him over the years before that, hey, go watch Taylor, you know, go see him. If, you know, if there's ever a chance that, that he makes a change, you know, maybe you guys could work together. And, you know, we're all here now, and I'm so fortunate to have had started that friendship, you know, back, you know, at the very start of college. And you guys are going to experience that. There's friendships that you're making in this room that, 
that will last this long and hopefully longer. And so, you know, to give you guys the opportunity here in Oklahoma to, to come to Oklahoma if you're not from here, see what the state's about, see what the golf courses are about. But really, it's another opportunity for you guys to start real relationships that will last. Um, and that's the thing that I'm most proud of to be able to help and give you guys or be a part of giving you guys that opportunity. Looking into it a little bit more, Boyd, you mentioned that when you were a junior golfer, you tried to emulate Tiger Woods. Taylor, Kelsey, was there anyone that you looked up to as a junior golfer? Did you try to emulate their swing or just kind of the way they carry themselves out on the golf course? Yeah, I mean, Tiger was the one. Uh, when I was five years old, my sister was born on April 11th, 1997, which was the same weekend that Tiger won his first Masters. And so, from when I was five years old, and I mean, even till now, whenever I see Tiger walk around, he's just, it's like, that's Tiger, you know? Uh, so yeah, he's, he's the one that, ins you know, inspired me uh, to and made golf cool and it made me want to, you know, try to go and win majors and be a professional golfer. And, you know, it's, it's Tiger. Well, first, Greg Norman, of course, for all the right reasons. And then Freddie Couples. Um, you guys, obviously, a little bit younger. Some of the dads in here know Freddie was the coolest dude there was. Uh, it's probably the only golf ball that hung up on the bank on 12 at Augusta. And he chipped it a foot and ended up winning. So I, I would probably call it the all-time good break. So for me, it was Greg Norman and Freddie Couples. Now we got a couple of fun questions for the three of you guys. Uh, do you have a favorite movie or TV show right now? Favorite movie, TV show of all time? God, that's a great question. It's impossible. It's like picking a favorite like hole or golf course or something. Um, God, Peaky Blinders comes to mind uh, for a favorite show. Uh, movie's impossible. Uh, so for a favorite show, I'm going to go with Peaky Blinders. All right, TV show, Ted Lasso, a couple lines there, have a goldfish memory, seven seconds is all they got, it's great in golf, it applies, and then I like one of the other lines, be curious, not judgmental, understand why people do things, I love the show for that, just the one-liners, um, movies, the Batman series, Dark Knight Rises, Batman Begins. TV shows that I've actually finished on whatever platform, I would probably say Homeland. Um, and then movies, man, I've seen a bunch of them, but uh, I'll go with Man on Fire with Denzel. All right, I don't even know what that was. <laughs> um, obviously, you guys all ended up in golf and, and kind of around golf with the foundation or through coaching or playing. Was there another job that kind of stuck out as a dream to you guys uh, growing up or? Uh, in your college days that you would have done if golf didn't work out? No. <laughs> I remember being in a high school banquet and Mike Weir was speaking and he gave the stats of how many people in this room are going to make it on tour and he said one of you in this crowd has a chance of being there and I just thought, okay, that's all I need is one. And if I said to you guys, hey, one or two, um, probably three or four, it's a lot more in this group because at the time it was in Utah, high school golf, he was, he was accurate. Here, there's going to be a little bit more. And I hope if I asked, hey, or said there's going to be four to five of you playing on tour, I hope all of you feel like, unless it's not your goal, hey, that's all I need. Even if you only had one and I'm with Taylor, uh, my mother-in-law would always say, well, you need a B plan. And so I always thought, I only want an A plan, and if the A plan doesn't work eventually, I'll move on to B plan. But it's hard when, you, in your mind, to get to the top level of a sport. Most people, they just stay consistent. That's all they wanted, and they keep on getting better a little bit every year. And that is very hard to do, and that's one thing that is incredible about Taylor is he's just gotten a little bit better, probably since you've been 12 years old, right? 13 years old, just a little bit better. And now he's one of the best players in the world. It's just because um, we like to say he's a dog. He just keeps on going, fighting, and he figures it out. You know, like Boyd said, I wanted to play for professional golf as well and, and play the tour. And I had a scratch with the mini tours and, and a few tour events. But 
you know, I can look back on, we'll call it 25 years of work life, and I've done a, a number of things, but um, I really believe that it all led me to this situation with Taylor and with Boyd and what we're doing right now. Uh, bits and pieces, pieces of my past helped me and shaped me and, and kicked me around to be able to understand and really how to deal with people. I always wanted to be around people or deal with people, uh, whether it was sales or whether it was coaching, which I did for a couple of years at Oklahoma Christian here in Edmond. Um, but I just knew whatever it was, it was going to be dealing with people because, you know, to me, that's kind of the, the reason to wake up, to see, to see people or, or build friendships and communicate. So to be doing what I'm doing now and to get to do things like this, you know, I told a guy last week, if I'm not the luckiest guy in the world, I'm definitely in the top three. So um, I feel so fortunate. Switching gears here a little bit um, for Boyd and for Taylor, if you guys could talk a little bit about the mental game and what, what it takes to, to play golf at such a high level from a mental side and kind of what you've gone through, whether it be struggles or successes with your mental game and any advice you have for the juniors. Man, I don't know if we have enough time. Um, what he just said, be a goldfish. Uh, you know, you, you have to forget, you know, what's happened uh, that, that wasn't good and you got to move on. Um, I always say there's a difference between confidence and belief. Uh, confidence is fleeting. You have to figure out how to believe. You have to believe in yourself beyond what you understand you are capable of. Uh, and that just takes time. That takes work. That takes effort. That takes successes. That takes overcoming failures. Um, you know, this, this game is, it's a journey, it's not a sprint. And so you have to look at it from that perspective. Um, I've always said, I, I want to look back on this career and look at it like it's a novel. I want to make sure every chapter that's, you know, I've put into this novel has been meaningful, it's been purposeful. Um, and every chapter, you know, was a big piece of the, the novel in, in, in its entirety. Um, and so you just, you have to believe in yourself and everybody ticks differently. You know, everyone, you know, figures out how to overcome failures differently, but you have to believe in yourself, you know, and that again, comes back to the work. Like there's no sacrifice, there's, there's no substitute for hard work and, and the work is going to be what is going to instill that belief. Um, but I, I kind of joke with people, but it's serious if, if, I didn't keep my own on the scorecards. If I didn't keep my own score, I would not be able to fill my scorecard out the end because I, I truly forget what I had on hole five. Like unless I write it down, I've, I've forgotten it. So I always, you know, use that as an example of you know you have to have a short memory. You can't you can't you know keep mulling over what you did on you know hole fourteen when you, you know, or 13 or whatever, where you miss a five footer. Um, you know, we, we as golfers are really good at nitpicking and finding where we could have improved. And that's important. Um, but when you're in the middle of competition in the heat of it, that what has happened cannot affect what is about to happen. Um, so when I played uh, a junior tournament in Ardmore, Oklahoma, I was already committed to go to, to uh, play golf at Oklahoma State University. And the coach then at the time, now the Baylor coach, Mike McGraw, um, was out at that tournament watching some other kids. But um, I, had a, I, I had a bad back nine on the final day. I had a chance to win tournament. I didn't. I finished like fourth or fifth. I had a terrible attitude. I was slamming clubs. Um, and it, my bad attitude derailed my back nine. Um, and it was probably off of one bad tee shot or, or you know, one missed putt or something, and it just derailed me. And uh, Coach McGraw did something that was pretty courageous. He, he sent me a letter, a uh, handwritten letter, uh, the next week basically saying, you know, I know you're going to be a cowboy. I know you're a great player, but what I just witnessed is not going to help you, and you will not play a lot of golf at Oklahoma State if you continue to do that. So quickly, I realized, like, I need to be positive. Like, I can't, you know, act like a fool out there because when I do, I let my anger get the best of me. It derails me. Um, so for me, you know, those, those few things as a junior golfer are what, you know, helped establish my uh, foundation uh, is, you know, you got to have a short memory and I can't let my anger get the best of me.
Yeah, I love that. That's one thing I've just noticed about him right off the bat is fierce competitor. And the thing I liked about him, and everybody has a different personal, personality. I touched on that yesterday. Dustin Johnson, my son Preston. There's plenty of players on tour that just are a little bit more laid back, chill, and they do forget, truly forget, and go on to the next hole. Uh, and some of us that aren't like that, a little more intense, we have to learn how to accept. Both of them help you move on to the next shot. And so you'll have to choose what type of player you are, and you know based on your personality, are you type that lets things go off the course easily, or are you a person that kind of has to process things to get over it. So identify which one you are, one that can truly just forget about it, like the goldfish, or you have to accept and move on because you know it's not gonna help you to dwell on that bad shot. Let the one bad shot cost you one shot. And then what I would um, challenge you with too to think about is the perception of luck. If Taylor hits it in the fairway and goes in a divot, he always hits the back of the ball. It's not a problem for him. He may look at it as not a bad break, but he just needed to learn that shot. Some of us, if we don't have that shot, going in a, in a divot would be perceived as a bad break. Hitting a cart path and going out of bounds, where do they usually put the cart pass? Off to the side. That was a bad shot, they hit the cart path. So the way we look at things and perceive things is very important. I always felt like I was a lucky player, and that helped me keep momentum, I want you guys to remember every, there's rub of the green, of course, it's an outdoor sport. The ball bounces in the fairway, it can land in the same spot, and one player's ball can bounce right, one player's ball can bounce left. But I would like you to remember the good breaks you get in the round, so then, and, and breaks are based on perception, but if you recognize at least your good breaks, when you do get a bad break in the round, you're like, hey, I already had two bad, good breaks, I just got what I feel like is a bad break. I'm still one up on luck. The three of you have talked about the relationships that you guys have built, whether it be through junior golf, college, um, where you guys are at now with your careers. Um, with all these relationships, who's your dream force to play with? God, that's a great question. Uh, for me, it would be Kelsey. It would be my dad. And the fourth, it's it's got to be Tiger, just because he's the one who inspired this whole thing. Um, and it would be at John Conrad, where I grew up playing playing golf, Midwest City, Oklahoma, about thirty minutes from here. Um, yeah, Dad, Kelsey, and Tiger. All right, I have three kids, so dream foursome would be Preston, Grace, and Cam. If it was uh, existing players right now, it would definitely be Tiger Woods. Um, my little brother Daniel that played the PGA Tour, super close with my brother, and God, let's think of a fourth. It's always been my kids as a foursome, but my father, he's the one that uh, got me into the game, taught me the game until I was 18, so that would be mine. I was going to say it would be Boyd's three kids, but I got to do that two years ago in December. Yes, I got beat by every one of them, but I did get assigned a scorecard, so I'm way ahead of the game there. So, um, so since that since that's out, you know, it uh, man, three. It would probably have to be Taylor and Nick Hughes and Vic Ramji right there with the with the cast on from surgery. One of our good golfing buddies. Thanks for coming, Vic. Is there anything else that you guys kind of want to touch on here as we're going? Would you like to open the floor, have some people answer, ask some questions, whatever you guys want to do? Does anybody have any questions? Dude, what's your lowest round ever? Uh, 61. Like, 
So my rookie year on the PGA Tour, um, I was playing with uh, the Torrey Pines Tournament, uh, the Farmers, um, and on PGA Tour, that tournament's usually around the first week of February, right? The first week of February, and um, so it's it's the first like big fan turnout. The, the, the few tournaments before that, like in Hawaii um, and Palm Springs, there's just not a bunch of fans out there. So you get to Torrey and, and there's you know tens of thousands of, of people. And so my, my rookie year, I get there. Uh, and on Saturday, I'm playing, I'm paired with Justin Rose. And I was, call it around 10th place going into Saturday. And uh, Justin Rose at the time was the number one player in the world. So first kind of big, big tournament for me on the PGA Tour, playing with the number one guy in the world. Um, and I was nervous as could be. Um, and I went and shot like 75 or 76, and I was just so concerned about what, um, you know, when I missed a four-footer or, or hit a bad tee ball, it's like, you know, I was concerned about what all these people would think that, you know, it's like, oh, this guy, you know, stinks. And for whatever reason, that just, it, it, it overcame me that day, and I went and played a terrible round of golf. I shot like 76 or whatever, and, and the course was not playing difficult that day and I went from call it 10th place to like 50th place uh, and the next day I, I don't even remember who I was playing with but obviously not the number one player in the world and um, we had an earlier tee time so there weren't you know as many crowds out I wasn't playing the one player in the world so not as many people following that group and I was not nearly as nervous and also because I wasn't in a you know great position to have a great tournament uh, you know it all of a sudden my care for like what people were you know thinking of me just went down and I went and played a nice round of golf and I quickly quickly realized so much of the pressure I was putting on myself was my what I thought others would think of me based off of a shot or a round um, and it's funny because you know people really don't care you know at the end of the day it, the only thing that matters is, is you know, did you give it your all? Did you try your best? Um, and so for, for whatever reason, it, it really clicked with me then. And, you know, I was 25 years old at the time. You know, I played some decent professional golf up to that point. But for me, it really, it, like, it was a moment of clarity of like, like, you know, this guy, this, you know, drunk guy in the crowd that's yelling gooch constantly, uh, why do I care what he thinks? Why does it matter? Why, why am I letting him, you know, add pressure to me, you know? And so for me, um, I, I kind of, I kind of learned that, you know, I, no one shot or one round is going to make or break my career. Um, and for me, that kind of, that helped me relax. Um, and so when the, when the moment gets big and it feels like it's a, it's a big moment, I look back to you know, a lot of those other moments that I felt like were big and at that time, and I now look back and kind of chuckle because I'm like, I can't believe I thought that was a big moment at that point in time. And that's where a lot of you guys will see, uh, you're going to get nervous this week, you're going to get nervous the next couple of days. And in a couple of years, you're, you're probably going to look back and kind of chuckle that you were getting nervous because you felt like it was such a big moment, and it might be, but you guys are going to go on to do bigger and better things uh, that's going to make this moment not seem quite as big. And so just, just remember, you know what, in a year, in two years, in five years, you know, this when you're starting to get nervous and you're starting to get afraid on the golf course, just remember, in a few years, you're probably not going to even remember what you did. Hence, like, I don't remember my lowest round of golf. So, yeah, just, just remember, it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's not really that big of a deal, and there's going to be bigger moments in the future. When you gone through a slump, what did you do to get out of it? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, I don't think there's really, like, any equation or any, like, special sauce you can just pour on it. Like, you just... You just gotta, you gotta go put the work in. You gotta go get on the range. You gotta go get on the putting green, and you gotta put the time in. Um, the having a short memory too, um, kind of back to.
to what we're talking about with, you know, you got to forget what's just happened. Um, you know, one of the things that Kelsey told me when I was really young was the, the penthouse and outhouse are always just around the corner from each other. It's why we often shoot, you know, a good round and follow it up with a bad round because this game, it forgets what you did yesterday. Uh, yesterday doesn't matter. So if you shot 65 yes, yesterday or if you shot 80 yesterday, that doesn't dictate what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, the only thing that you can control is, you know, are you putting the work in? Are you going to the range after the rounds? Are you, you know, doing your drills on a putting group? Um, so again, there's, there's, no, um, there's no substitute for hard work. Hard work is going to be the only thing I think that's going to be able to get you out of a slump. You guys talked earlier about uh, the question about what's changed in junior golf. The biggest thing in, in the last 30 years. One of the biggest things I've seen is technical data with TrackMan, GC Quad, and all that stuff. So, Boyd and Taylor, how much time do you guys spend looking at that data, and what do you recommend for for the, the players in here on using that data to get better? Now, I coach for a living now, and. When people ask me that same question, why are kids so much better, it would be kind of arrogant for me to say, well, it's just the coaching, it's all the technology, when in reality, if you go on the tour, when a player uses track men, the best players on tour are looking for spin rate, where it launches, and how far it goes. Someone that owns track men wants to say that all these players are using it for swing path, swing direction, uh, spin loft, I could go on and on, and I know that from the best players in the world that I've had been fortunate enough to teach, Taylor, Tony Finau, they're using that information to, in those GC quads and track man to do distance, and carry the spin rates, know how far it goes with certain wind directions, but I'd say with Taylor, he doesn't use it a whole lot. He has the, the equipment, the technology, but he knows how far his ball flies. I've never seen anybody that has as good a distance control as him. But, you know, to answer your question, yeah, they do play a factor, but some of the best players in the world have come from different generations where they haven't gotten obsessed with that. I've heard of plenty of players that get on gears and, you know, the 3D information and the force plates, and in the end, sometimes it actually confuses them and gives them too much information and starts to cloud up the brain, so it becomes a little, little less athletic action. Yeah, I, I would say for me, like he's just said, uh, we, we only use it uh, for ball numbers. We don't use it for any club numbers. Obviously, different people have different methods, um, but I think it's, um, you know, at the professional level, uh, a quiet mind is, is something that's irreplaceable. Um, there's very few people that can uh, intake a bunch of information and then go and perform. Um, we often see uh, at the junior level, the amateur college, professional, you know, golfers were thinkers for the most part. And it's easy for us to start looking at a bunch of information and start, you know, letting that become dictate so much. Um, so. With all of that, our advice usually is less is more, um, and that's why for us we just use uh, those you know different machines for uh, ball numbers. Which next little thing are you most excited for? The the Miami one, the end of the season one, is awesome. Um, it's it's purely team competition. There's there's not an individual aspect to it, um, and it is the most nervous I've ever been on a golf course was last year in Miami uh, on the final day when the team uh, that I was on last year had a chance to win. Um, I mean, it was you know it, you counted all four scores, um, and the golf course was it's really really difficult. You almost every hole you're one swing away from a big number. Um, and you know it's the, it was the biggest purse in golf. It, you know the winning team got four million dollars a player, and so um, you know you're sitting there. It's it's a little different when you make a hit a bad shot, and you know you're not 
affecting other players, you know, uh, their income. But uh, whenever, you know, if you make a bad swing, you're potentially costing three other guys $4 million. That, that hides the things a little bit. So because of, because of that, it just, it, it, the energy uh, is just, it's amplified that week. Um, and it's just different than what we see on a week-to-week -week basis in professional golf, uh, with it being just the, the you know, a team event. Um, so it, it's, it's awesome. So thanks, Keith, and appreciate your support in May. Um, the, th the three main groups that we help here in Oklahoma, one is Positive Tomorrows, which is a school for homeless kids. Basically, they provide everything uh, from meals to backpacks to shower to laundry and um, bus, bus situations. Some of their kids don't sleep on the, in the same bed or same couch, you know, more than two nights a week. So they have an um, intricate bus you know, route system. Last year, we were able to donate the money to buy a brand new bus for them that gets fifty. That has the opportunity to get fifty-three more kids to school. Um, some of the stuff that some of us may take for granted and think that's just the way it works. You know, these kids don't have that. So, uh, Positive Tomorrow's is one of them. Hope is Alive is a drug and alcohol facility here in Oklahoma. Uh, their offices and their program. They kind of an offshoot of that. They do have a drug and alcohol program, but they have 25 sober living houses in five states. I may miss that by one or two. Um, in my life, you know, I've been affected by drugs and alcohol from a family and friend standpoint on three or four occasions. So when Taylor and his wife brought it up, you know, to be one that we may help, um, I was all for it. And, and what, what most of the adults in the room know, whether it's, um, a friend or family or a loved one that's been affected or gone through that, you know, when we help parents get back on their feet or we donate the money to do that, a lot of the times it reunites families or a mother and a father with their kids. So in turn, it helps the parent, but it's also helping the kids, which is something we, that Taylor mentioned that, that the foundation is very much uh, focused on. And then also, obviously, he grew up on the Oklahoma Junior Golf Tour, which is an offshoot of the OG of the Oklahoma Golf Association. You know, Taylor will tell you that it's you know one of the main reasons he's he's here. And so to help help our local kids that play that, help it make it bigger and better and brighter and more things and better food and better gear and trophies and all the things that you know that we love and appreciate as junior golfers. You know, we help that. Obviously, adding the AJJ in the AJGA in that uh, this year. Hopefully, we can do it from years to come. Um, but those are the main three, now four, situations that we help. Or whatever, and 
the the winner would get to choose dinner that night where we ate dinner at. And um, you know, we my family's favorite dinner, like celebration dinner growing up was Olive Garden. And so uh, on the way to the golf course I saw an Olive Garden and I go and, and the coach's like, alright, we're gonna I forget what the competition was, but here's competition and um, and I won the competition and so uh, at the end of the day we get in the bus and coach is like, alright. T, you on? Where are we going? And uh, let's just say the the dudes, uh, the other dudes on the team. One of the dudes, uh, his name was Sean Einhaus. Uh, he's from Nepal. He's literally he was royalty. Like his like his mom was basically like the queen of Nepal. And um, so let's just say he didn't fly Southwest Airlines a whole bunch. And so whenever uh, I got to pick dinner, I said, all right, coach, we're going to Olive Garden. Uh, the other four uh, teammates, they just lost their mind. They're like, you get to pick anywhere, hey, we're going to Olive Garden, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so needless to say, we didn't go to Olive Garden that night. I got overruled. Um, I got introduced to uh, uh, a steakhouse I'd never heard of called Vic and Anthony. Is it Vic and Anthony's? You would know Vic and Anthony's. And uh, yeah, it was it was it was a little bit nicer than you know the celebration dinner uh, that I was used to. Um, so that was always for me one of my, one of our favorite things was you know the whoever won got to pick you know where we would go to dinner that night. What's the most uh, unruly or chaotic event you've ever played in? Waste management. Yeah, waste management is is insane. Um, this last year on on uh, live as well in Australia, there was a hole that they kind of mimicked uh, the the par three at uh, waste management, the stadium hole. It was so loud that I couldn't hear my caddy. Like we had to literally get into each other's ears to be able to like. I'm like, hey, what's the number? And he had to like get in my ear to tell me what the number was because I couldn't hear him. And so I've, I've never experienced noise like that before that we're standing right next to each other and I couldn't even hear him. Um, so that, that was insane. But waste management is just, I mean, there's nothing like it. I was playing um, practice round, I think my second year on tour with Max Homo, who's one of my best buddies out there. Um, and he, at that time, Monday qualified. Um, into it, and so we're playing together on Tuesday, and this is the first time that he had played in the waste management, and we so we're playing 18 holes on 18 holes on Tuesday, and we make the turn, we you know get off nine green, and we hear this is Tuesday, and we hear like a loud roar, and we look at each other, and we're like, is, was there really a roar on Tuesday? And then he was like, is it bad that I'm already nervous? So yeah, waste management is is insane. What's the weirdest shot you've hit during the tournament? Weirdest shots. So uh, it wasn't necessarily weird, but um, it was uh, the Honda, uh, the Honda Classic at PJ National. Um, there's a par three that's almost an island green, and um, the like you know right off of the edge of the like where the land goes into the water, there was some mud, and of course I hit it, landed up you know on land and went into the mud, and so I could see it and I could hit it. So I'm either going back and reteam, or I'm getting in there and I'm hitting it. And so of course I you know pull my pants up, I take my shoes off, and I do the whole thing. I'd never done it before. And I get in there and I mean you don't practice that shot, so it's you have no idea how to hit it. And the one thing I wasn't gonna do was leave it in the mud still, so I swung hard and it went over the grandstand behind the green. I thought it was gonna come out a little bit softer than that, and it went over. It was embarrassing because you know I go and you know do this whole charade and then I go and I hit it. I look like a fool, I hit it over the grandstands, I had to go get, take a drop be, like because I couldn't see the green from because of the big grandstand, so I had to go like 80 yards like over to like take a drop to be able to see the green, and it took us like 30 minutes to play this little 150 yard hole, um, and yeah, 
that. So I haven't played that course since then because, you know, a little bit of scarring memories there. Thanks for coming out. I enjoyed it and uh, a lot of fun.